I'd like to introduce to you Bill Brown, WB8ELK, and Bill is going to talk to us about his GPS-enabled digital mode transmitter. And take it away, Bill. Okay, if we could bring up the website first of all before I get started with my talk. Uh, there's a uh, we talked about SparkFun earlier, and I wanted to show you a little a module that I found on SparkFun. It's a uh, little tiny thing called a RF link transmitter on 434 megahertz. And if you click on the picture, we'll do a little blow up of it. Uh, that uh, Morse code you hear on my radio that sounds like it's uh, going through a rural. <laughs> One, one thing is the um, reception on an ARR 3000 for Morse code is a little rough, but there's a little bit of frequency drift with that saw resonator with temperature, and, uh, and it's, it's a little rough. But I actually have flown this and heard it 100 miles away. They claim 300 feet. <laughs> but when you put it on a balloon at 100,000 feet, uh, it's 80 to 100 miles, and you get a good signal, just with a little three-element handheld beam and a preamp and this radio. It sounds like this, though, but, but I can copy that. Well, I decided to solve that problem, and uh, I AM modulated it by turning it on and off at 1,000 hertz. I get 1,000 hertz AM tone. And uh, I'll, show, I'll demonstrate that. And you can see, this is simply a little perf board, that little module that I showed. There we go. And uh, it's very simple. I've got a little microcontroller, 9-volt battery. This weighs 3 ounces, and it's good enough to track from about uh, a mile or two away sitting on the ground. So it's a great little fox hunt transmitter, and it's pretty cheap when you consider the transmitter itself is $3.95. Uh, but I decided the frequency drift problem was a little, little tough because it can drift a few kilohertz during a, a flight because it gets down to 60 below zero. And I just put bubble wrap around this and use so solar heating. If you put black tape around it, put bubble wrap around it, you get a greenhouse effect, and it actually stays above freezing. Uh, but I usually use a 9-volt lithium battery. This is not one of those, but uh, it makes three ounces, and that's a little experiment that makes a great fox hunt transmitter and a balloon beacon. Uh, so I'll show you this one here. This is the same thing, only it's got a pressure transducer, temperature sensor, and that same spark uh, fun transmitter. Uh, this one I launched and it was found six months later by a hunter in the woods. And it still works after it's sitting out in the woods. And I will plug this in. Now, the beauty of this is, since it's AM modulated, I don't have the frequency drift problem. Of course, it helps if I turn in the right mode on my radio. And that's standard 45 baud ready which if we use that uh, probability filter, that could really help. In fact, I do use FL Digi to decode this. But you see, I'm moving it around, and it's drifting in frequency, but the AM is so wide, it makes no difference in the signal. And in fact, I can also use this technique to uh, do a number of digital modes that can be uh, audio modulated. But that's simply just keying it on and off uh, 1,000 hertz and 1,170 hertz, so I get my 170 hertz shift. And so I just have two tones, uh, PWM tones, turning that chip on and off. And it's very high quality, and it decodes beautifully. I will pass uh, this one around. All right, uh, basically... I've been flying balloons to the stratosphere for 22 years now. Uh, in fact, I flew one of the very first packet digipeters, and people were using it as a digipeter that covered a 12-state area when it was flown over Ohio. And uh, 
We've been flying digital nodes on balloons. APRS is very popular now because it gives us a real-time position of the balloon and, of course, ties into uh, the mapping systems on the Internet. So um, we do a lot of student programs. Uh, it's a great way of introducing students to uh, aerospace and ham radio. Uh, I help with a class at University of Alabama Huntsville. And if you go to the next slide, I want to describe a... Uh, a new, I had a project where I was going to send a balloon across the Atlantic Ocean. And uh, in fact, there's a number of us and a couple of universities that are uh, we're doing the, a challenge. And uh, last year, I made it to Nova Scotia from a launch in Alabama. And uh, there was a group from University of Tennessee's Amateur Radio Club that made it within 300 miles of Ireland. They stayed up 40 hours and went 3,500 miles. Uh, but how do you get the data back from a balloon that's way, way, way beyond any kind of digipeter? Now, the one I did in Nova Scotia had an APRS transmitter on it, and I was getting signals from 350 miles away in Halifax, Nova Scotia. Unfortunately, I was 350 miles out to sea, so when it came down, I never did see it again. So maybe a fishing trawler will scoop it in someday. Uh, I've gotten a, quite a few of these backs that, that I just, so, so quite often I'll send up these smaller ones where I don't expect to ever see it again and they'll come back. Somebody will find it eventually. But the ones that have gone out to sea, I generally don't get back. Um, they probably hit the Bermuda Triangle and they <laughs> go back in time and space. So maybe that's what caused uh, semiconductor research. Somebody found it. <laughs> So I had a problem. How do I get the data back uh, from a balloon over the ocean? Well, a satellite transponder is very pricey. And uh, I looked into it. It was $1,000 for the unit. And uh, it was a dollar for uh, transmission. And just very pricey. However, recently there have been a unit called the Find Me Spot. Have any of you have ever seen that one yet? Uh, it's a little orange unit that's designed for hikers, and uh, it's really cool because it trans has a GPS receiver and it transmits directly to the Global Star um, satellite network. It'll be laying upside down in the mud and still get a signal up and show up on a map. And, but unfortunately, it only transmits every 10 minutes, and uh, you do have to buy it. A, a subscription service. It's about $100 a year, but the unit itself costs $150. And if you lose it, your subscription is still good. They just replace it, which when I send them across the Atlantic, I very likely will lose it. Of course, I'm going to make it so that when I do dump down in the ocean, uh, I will then have a buoy because it'll last about two weeks on a pair of AA batteries. And it'll be interesting to see if I can make it across to, uh, on the Gulf Stream. So I came up with this idea. A number of different groups came up with HF transmitters that uh, used uh, Morse code. Uh, I don't know if any of you have followed. Uh, there was University of Tennessee did one on 30 meters. Uh, up in uh, New York, uh, Cornell did one that uh, they were also on 30 meters. And uh, we could hear it for thousands of miles away. And they were running about a watt on Morse code. Well, the problem with Morse code is, you know, Getting a program to decode it and uh, not have a lot of garbage in it, it's a real tricky thing. There, it can be done, but if the signal fades, and you're going to get a lot of noise in the signal. So the best way to decode Morse code is what I call a, a meat computer. <laughs> <laughs> so I decided to start investigating um, an HF transmitter that used digital modes. So these are the modes I investigated, and uh, I, a lot of the modes are very complex. You have a lot of uh, convoluted uh, things that you have to do for error, error correcting and encoding, uh, things like Olivia and uh, those kind of modes I looked into, even MFSK. So I found these modes are the simplest to implement on a microcontroller with limited memory. Uh, Hellschreiber, believe it or not, that is very easy to implement. It is simply a fast CW. It's 8.163 milliseconds per character, 
and it paints the uh, image onto a screen like, like slow scan or facsimile. And uh, the human eye actually helps when it's a real noisy signal, your eye does the image processing and can pull those characters out of the visual image. So it's a very weak signal mode, and since I'm working with one watt here, uh, I mean, and below, that's a QRP transmitter, and uh, when I'm 1,000 or 2,000 miles away, I need all the help I can get. Uh, RIDI, RIDI works well, but you get any kind of noise in the signal, it'll flip from characters to numbers to letters, and you got problems, and you're gonna drop out characters. So if you have a fading signal or a weak signal, RIDI uh, works, but not as well as some other modes. My finally settled upon Domino EX, and uh, that is a really nice um, weak signal mode. It uses 18 tones and uh, doesn't require a lot of encoding, and so it's fairly straightforward to put on a microcontroller. And uh, I'm just about ready to implement APRS on this as well. Uh, it also do slow scan. Uh, I have an onboard GPS. Uh, that's the uh, GPS that's integrated on the board, and there's a patch antenna. <clears throat> that is a Cypress PSOC micro microcontroller, and that little tiny chip there, which by the way uh, is a real challenge, that's a, called a TSOP package, it's really fine pitch. That is the clock synthesizer chip. Above that, I have a voltage control crystal oscillator which feeds the reference signal to the clock oscillator. That's 16.384 megahertz. And then I follow that with a class C amplifier and an output filter. This can be set up on any frequency from about three megahertz to 160 megahertz. The only difference is between HF and VHF is to the output filter has changed. I'm gonna have a final version of this board where I can plug in different output filters so you can use the same board for HF or VHF. Uh, so I also have a temperature sensor both inside and out. It monitors the battery. I get one watt on HF bands and about uh, four tenths of a watt on two meter FM. Serentel makes a heli helical GPS antenna and I found that this works better than the patch antenna. So my final version of the board, which I'll have in about two weeks, is going to incorporate this uh, helical uh, GPS antenna. It'll work inside my house, uh, even in the basement. It's really sensitive. The GPS receiver that I'm using is made by a company called InventTech. Uh, the problem with the many GPS receivers is they don't work above 60,000 feet. And I had spent a lot of time up there. Uh, we go up, my highest flight's 118,000 feet, and quite often we always go up to about 100,000, between 90 and 100. Uh, this company makes a special firmware build that will allow it to go up to over 135,000 feet. And it's fairly inexpensive. It's a $35 chip, and it solders right onto the board. Um, I'm really pleased with its performance. Um, and this is the power supply section and the uh, GPS section. Uh, there's the pressure transducer, temperature sensor, the Cypress PSOC chip, and that's the clock chip that I use. Uh, you see I'm feeding a 16.384 reference frequency to this clock synthesizer. Now, most people tend to use the analog devices, uh, 80, 90, 9854, I think it is, or 9954, in DDS kind of applications, which is direct digital synthesis of a frequency. Uh, I did not opt to go that route because A, there's multiple voltages that you have to be concerned about with that analog device's chip, which adds more um, problems with my power supply distribution. And B, it's much more expensive than the way I implemented this. Uh, I don't get quite the, as fine a frequency uh, control, but that's a $6 chip from Cypress, the uh, 22393 and it'll generate a frequency uh, all the way up to 148 or better megahertz uh, with a 16 megahertz uh, reference. Now, I have a voltage control crystal oscillator up there because it allows you to do frequency shift keying. 
an actual hardcore frequency shift keying. It's not audio. It generates the frequencies and makes the shifts. Uh, and I have a pot to adjust that finely so I can get it just right. Uh, but that allows me to do MFSK modes, teletype, and, and even FM. I can generate F FM with that same, same system when I'm on two meters FM. Uh, so it's, it's a very low cost way of doing things and, uh, and it works great. I follow that with a class C amplifier and an output filter because this generates about 10 milliwatts from the get-go there. I'm using a Cypress PSOC. Who of you have ever tried uh, the Cypress uh, PSOC chip? Okay. Uh, the really neat thing about it, I got suckered in when they were offering a $10 development system, and I says, you know, whenever I see an offer like that, I have to go for it. And uh, I really got hooked on it. it. There was a bit of a le learning curve because it's got a graphical user interface where you lay out modules. They have... Uh, it's a mixed mode chip, so they have analog modules and digital modules all built in the chip. I actually have a D to A converter that's built on the chip, and you place those modules and wire them to the output and input pins. And then you write your code, and I use C. There's a free compiler for it uh, from High High Tech and uh, I think ImageCraft. This is what uh, the Hellschreiber output looks like. You'll see my call sign, time, latitude, longitude, and altitude. Um, that's how the display looks when it's received on, uh, there's several different programs that will decode this for you, multi-PSK, FL-Digi, or something called Hellschreiber, Hell-Hell, they call it. Uh, it's a guy in Italy, IK8BLOY, I think it is. Um, so either program you use, um, it'll actually save snapshots of your data if you set it up that way. Uh, it's a great simple implementation because you're just keying it on and off. It's rapid CW. Uh, the trickiest part is uh, generating the characters through a lookup table. And that, that takes up some room because you actually have to generate the on and off bars that represent the, la the letters. Um, basically, if it's key down, it's a black pixel. If it's key up, it's a white pixel. And it just paints it one vertical column at a, row at a time. I opted for Domino EX. Uh, this was uh, created by a couple of guys in, uh, out of uh, New Zealand, uh, ZL1 BPU and ZL2 AFP. I hope I got those right. Um, and you don't hear it a lot on the HF band. It's primarily for HF. Um, but you really don't hear it too much. People tend to use something that sounds very similar, which is Olivia and Catestia. Um, but I really love this mode. Uh, I, think, I think more people should use it because it is phenomenal. It handles uh, extremely weak signals. You can decode it with about 10 dB under the noise level. I mean, you can barely tell there's something in the noise and it'll be perfect copy. And that's without forward error, error correction. Um, I don't even use FE, FEC mode because it's such a robust uh, mode that uh, you don't need it. Uh, plus it gains you another, it speeds up the things by about twice. Uh, there's different modes for um, just how weak signal you want to get, but I've opted for either Domino 11 or Domino 22. 22 moves along at about 140 words per minute, so that's, that's a pretty good clip. That's, you know, almost three times faster than uh, standard ready. Uh, and it's great. You can get a lot of data over a long distance with this. Uh, but those are the common modes that Domino uses. The really nice thing about Domino, it's an 18 tones, 10, space 10.766 hertz apart, at least for the 11 mode. Um, and it's just a great, uh, great mode. Uh, the Domino uses a uh, varicode alphabet, and so you've got both upper and lower case and special characters, and... Uh, it's based on the incremental frequency keying, they call it IFK. It's the difference between the tones that creates the nibble. Here's what it sounds like. That's, that was Domino EX22 mode. Now the uh, 
slower modes, you actually hear the tones very slowly. The four baud mode goes dee 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 dee. You know, it's it's uh, you can actually play music with that one, I think. Um, but you see, they actually, the neat thing about it is uh, they've got a primary character set and a secondary character set. So um, if we go to the next slide, uh, you'll see that there's a primary output. Um, you see the telemetry there, which is call sign, time, latitude, longitude, um, altitude. You can do speed and heading and battery voltage. Uh, I just separate all the fields with a forward slash. Uh, you can cr get a lot of data back from this. Um, and that's what the spectrum looks like for Domino EX22. But the secondary character set is you can, there's a little field up there towards the top, right in here. There, you can put a little message there by using the secondary Veracode alphabet. And so you can have a scrolling message just going there during the idle period of uh, Domino EX. So when it idles, it sends a little canned message in that little window. So it's a really neat mode. This is multi PSK. Uh, it does just about every mode under the sun. Uh, there are only a few of these free programs and or pay programs that handle Domino EX, however. And uh, this is one of them. And it works uh, really well. But it'll also do ready ECW and PSK31 and all the other modes. Uh, I opted against PSK31 because the transmitter does tend to drift in the cold temperatures because it can get down to 40 below zero or better. And uh, so my transmitter will drift about uh, 300 hertz or so during a mission. Uh, Domino EX can handle 200 hertz a minute, and which is really phenomenal because MFSK, you have to be dead on to get good copy, and the same goes for PSK31. Uh, the other program I use is FL Digi. Uh, it also does just about every mode out there. However, there's a mod uh, that will allow you to upload data to a server. And uh, there's a group in uh, Great Britain that actually uses that data to plot on a Google map uh, in real time. So it's just like APRS, only we're using digital modes. Uh, we could do this for teletype or just about any digital mode that you can get a text file off of. Uh, I tried a test with a half watt signal on 40 meters over a 1,000 mile path between Alabama and uh, Connecticut. W1TWT has a Ken1 TS2000 that can be remotely controlled using a program called Log Me In. And this is one of those, it's like go to my PC. It's, uh, you can control somebody's PC over the internet if you have the access code. And he allowed me to access the computer in his ham shack. Uh, which is actually in his barn, and uh, I could control his Kenwood TS-2000. Now there's a, a free version of this program that does not have sound, and then you have to pay like, I think it's $50 a year, and then you get very high quality sound as part of this. So you literally can control your radio anywhere in the world and hear sound come back. But if you wanted to use the free program, uh, Thomas came up with a uh, real neat uh, hack for that. He uses Skype. So what you do, you log on to his computer, and you act, turn on his Skype, which then transmits the audio from his radio back to you. And it's all free. And it works rather well. So I did a series of tests for a couple of weeks, just about every evening from about midnight till 3 in the morning where uh, the band conditions were a lot of people on it, over on 40 meters over a 1,000 mile path, and I compared all the digital modes. RIDI, eh, it's about 20% copy under over a three hour period. Hellschreiber, I got about 40%. Domino EX was 90% or better. It was really phenomenal, and that's a half watt signal. Um, it, it really, uh, it's at least 3 dB better than Hellschreiber even. And I'd say probably 10 dB better than uh, RIDI for reliable copy. Another program that you can use is MixW, although MixW does not do Domino EX. Ham Radio Deluxe does Domino EX, but only the 8, the 4, 8, 16, 
uh, modes, it doesn't do the odd modes for some reason. So I think he's working on adding those in the future. Um, I'm also using this uh, a device from iobridge.com. It's a way of hooking this on an ethernet connection to your router and you can uh, control relays and uh, all kinds of stuff by going to their website and you have a little user account area that's given to you free uh, with this device and it sends uh, analog and digital in and out to the website and you can just control it by clicking on your on little widgets and you can add controls to your own web page and turn things on and off in your ham shack and sense things on and off in your ham shack and it even has a temperature sensor uh, all done uh, through just an ethernet connection and, but you don't have to worry about all the routing it's all done for you and this is like a hundred dollar device and I've had it running for a couple of months and it's never dropped out on me and so I can turn lights on and off in the ham shack. It'll actually go through those X10 modules and turn lights on and off remotely. And I can tell if somebody's walked into my house, uh, I recently got broken into and had my computer stolen and all my data. So now I have a PIR sensor, motion sensor hooked up to this. And if somebody walks in, it'll flash a little red bar up on my web page. So uh, it's real handy. And uh, I use this to turn on my beacon radio. Uh, I have a ham shack that's about 20 miles from my other house up on the mountain. So I do 20-mile uh, path tests by using this to key on a beacon transmitter that I'm testing. Uh, I wanted to show you uh, how to implement uh, slow scan in this module, too. Uh, this is my first prototype for the uh, final board. And uh, you can see I use some of those. We, we mentioned earlier about uh, using a SparkFun prototype where you use a surface mount chip and bring it out to a dip package. You'll see that that is actually what I did when I was prototyping the, my final circuit for the multi-mode transmitter. So this is my first prototype. It's got a, a GPS receiver, uh, the, uh, a dip version of the uh, PSOC, and uh, this was a little beat up because it went on a balloon flight landed in, uh, out in uh, Tennessee, in North, actually in North Carolina, and a pickup truck ran over it and drug it down the road about 100 feet. <laughs> and then he sent it back to me after he ran over the package because he didn't know what it was. He thought it was a beer coal cooler of some sort. And, you know, it still works. <laughs> I'm going to pass this around for people to see, too. Now, that particular one is set up for 2-meter FM, but uh, it could also be set up for HF frequencies uh, on any HF band. Uh, also, this is my final, final version of the Domino EX uh, transmitter. By the way, when you're running FM uh, with Domino EX, you can copy this clear down to the noise level, um, you know, where you can barely hear an FM signal. Just barely hear that something's in there, you can still get perfect copy. So there's even an advantage with running Domino EX on FM rather than sideband. Um, it's like a 3 or to 6 dB advantage even on an FM mode over other modes. Um, if you were just right at the noise level, you'd be really hard pressed to pick up an APRS signal, I would think. Uh, but this is, of course, a lot less baud rate than 1200 baud. Uh, this package has flown uh, ten, 10 times to uh, the stratosphere and uh, it's been recovered because we use this as the primary tracker and uh, I use APRS as a backup now because this, this works. Lying on the ground, I can hear this two miles away. Even at the noise level, I can still copy the position from the telemetry. Uh, as you can see, this is my backup recovery system. It's a reward sign. I've used that. And you'll notice my uh, prominent use of duct tape because, after all, real science is not possible without duct tape. <laughs> and this is uh, basically how I package it. That's the uh, final version of the uh, multi-mode transmitter. Now, I'll have this on display in the uh, 
display room, and uh, I'll power that up for those that want to see it. It'll be on display in the elk room. That's right. <laughs> yeah, how appropriate. Uh, let's see. Let's go back to the talk and uh, go to the next slide. Uh, by the way, this is an outside temperature uh, sensor. I generate two modes in slow scan. Uh, it's a little hard to find specs for slow scan. I had to do a lot of searching, but once you find all the specs, uh, then it's fairly straightforward. Um, and con considering I can generate a variety of frequencies with the voltage control crystal oscillator, I can actually generate the slow scan uh, directly. I don't have to use an audio modulation to a sideband transmitter. So I'm just using a Class C CW transmitter that I'm shifting around in the actual frequency, and it works just fine. Um, I decided to use Martin uh, 1 and 2, and there's a new mode for narrow modes that uh, JE3HHT uh, has come up with, uh, and that can be used in the digital section of the band on the HF segments because it's 500 hertz or less. Uh, the mode I'm using that's the narrowband mode is MC110-N. Uh, it's still a work in progress. I got one part of my calls <laughs> transmitted, so... Uh, but uh, when I find the time, this will be my next uh, project, is to implement uh, a full-blown SSTV on this. There's actually a camera available from uh, another website I like called Electronics123, and uh, this outputs a serial data of the uh, video. So it solves a lot of problems with getting video data into a microcontroller. Wanted to show you uh, Scott uh, N1VG. Um, he's also the owner of Argent Data and the Open Tracker, for those of you who've uh, seen that. And this is his uh, version of uh, decoding that uh, camera I just showed you and generating he used Scott ES1 for a test transmission. So that's the kind of quality you can get off of a microcontroller, uh, very small, slow scan television system. Uh, this is what the balloons look like uh, when we send them up into near space. Uh, they're about uh, 10 foot in diameter and uh, take about a tank of helium for, we can lift 12 pounds. And we do a lot of student uh, flights and uh, in fact we have actually an aerospace class and uh, it's a senior project for our electrical engineering students at University of Alabama Huntsville. And uh, they uh, form, there's 15 of them, and they form groups of three or four, and they have, we launch a balloon for each team. And so they come up with different experiments, and that's their senior project. And uh, about half of them get their ham radio licenses, and they actually use them afterwards. So it's a great way of, uh, because they thought, you know, just talking to each other doesn't thrill them anymore. I mean, you can do that with a cell phone or Skype. But they really get into the digital aspect of it. Being able to pick up telemetry in real time from a balloon just excites them. They like that. And it gets a lot of them in, intrigued about ham radio again. And uh, I like to encourage that. Uh, we were flying ATV, APRS, and the Domino transmitter in this particular one. This is a, a program we did for Kentucky for a lot of, um, it's called Kentucky Space. It's a group of 16, uh, well, the six colleges and 16 students are building a microsat. And uh, it's called KYSat. And uh, I tried to tell them that there would be a good sponsor for them, but I <laughs> I don't know if they're going to try that. <laughs> but they, uh, they really uh, have quite a group there, and they are building a microsat that they plan to launch uh, in the next uh, year or two. Uh, and this is the way they test a lot of their subsystems before they put it in the microsat. And this is, a, this is the launch uh, showing that. Now, at the banquet, I'll have a lot more pictures showing the BalloonSat program and uh, I'll have some videos. Uh, do we have any questions? Since you have uh, K Y set, are you thinking about the uh, Trojan balloons? <laughs> <laughs> I don't know if that was worth getting him the microphone. <laughs> when you launch those balloons, do you have to get like FAA uh, notice? If it's under 12 pounds and each package has to be under 6 pounds, that's wavered and it falls under what's called part 
FAA Part 101. So you don't have to, the, all you have to do is file a NOTAM, which is a notice to airmen that you're flying, but you don't have to go through lengthy paperwork with the FAA or get permission. As long as you are not in like O'Hare airspace, you'd yeah. have trouble here. We might object to that. <laughs> oh, you could fly here, you really could, but you'd have to do some coordination. Uh, we had one group uh, launch a balloon from Wisconsin. It ended up floating, and uh, it landed in uh, northern Illinois, a very appropriate place to land, but probably the worst possible place you'd want to land something like this. Can you guess where that was? O'Hare, that's right. <laughs> right next to the main jet runway. And uh, they got the security guys fired up when they showed up in their trucks around the perimeter. It says, uh-oh, it's out there. And it was, it was dark. So the security guy says, yeah, we'll go out there. That sounds like fun. We're bored, taking a coffee break. So they drive across one runway. They get up to the main runway of O'Hare and their spotlight shows the orange parachute and the payload just on the side of the main jet runway. So they get real excited. This is like their first fox hunt. <laughs> and they drive across the main runway without calling the tower. Oh. And they see headlights coming at them. <laughs> it's a 747. So they zoom across in front of the landing 747, pick up the package, they go back to the gate and says, guys, we're gonna take a very long break and hide. I advise you all to leave now. <laughs> but uh, actually O'Hare was uh, alerted that they were gonna be dropping a payload on them, so they were actually aware of it. So they, they weren't real happy about the security guys running in front of the jet, though. Okay, any other questions? I'm sorry, Bill. Yeah, just one thing. I will be uh, offering a kit of the final board in about two weeks. It'll be, uh, you can check my website and I'll have a link on there. It's wb8elk.com and my company is called Elktronics, e -E -L -K -tronics Uh Any other questions? I have a question for you. Um, what's the average cost of putting up a balloon like that? Uh, the balloon cost about $150. The helium is about another 100 for a big, this is a 12 pound uh, package. And then of course the cost of the lithium batteries, which is I'm using primary cells. You can use a rechargeable uh, RC version if you want. And, uh, and then whatever you want to risk. So uh, I have launched very small balloons um, that cost hardly anything at all. I have the advantage they do an ozone monitoring balloon out of Huntsville every week and they allow me to fly these small transmitters for free. I just tack them onto the ozone sond and they'll take me up to 105,000 feet every week. So I, I'm really blessed to have that right in my backyard in Huntsville because uh, they have excess lift capacity. But the neat thing is they offer a $30 reward if you recover their ozone sond because it costs $600. So we use this to track it down and particularly when I have APRS, it's real easy to find. <laughs> and then it pays for my gas. <laughs> that remind, that really goes back to our days of finding soda pop bottles that's, and returning. That's right. Okay, right. that's it. Thank you, Bill.